For millennia, there have been tales of what lies beneath our feet inside our very planet, ranging from hidden wildlife to UFO origins to ancient civilizations. These stories have carried on through the ages. Today, we're going to discuss the legends and stories surrounding hollow earth theory. This is Red Web. It's a Mystery Monday. I'm Trevor Collins. That's Alfredo Diaz. We got a bit of a compilation one today, Alfredo. Hell yeah. I'm actually excited because I want to do Hollow Earth. Um, yeah. Just, yeah. I mean, there's movies and that's how I know a lot of these types of things is through movies and film. Um, you know, I, I, I'm expecting some dinosaurs. Yeah. Aside from yeah. that, I feel like it can get really weird. It can definitely get very weird. Uh, I'm so excited that we're covering this one because... Hollow Earth theory, I think everyone kind of knows about, but there are so many unique anecdotes throughout time that almost substantiate this idea of Hollow Earth. Now, of course, by the end of this episode, we don't really have theories to explore, so I'm just going to kind of scientifically dunk on the theory of Hollow Earth. Got Um, it, yeah. But God, (laughs) these stories are so fascinating to me. Yeah, I mean, there's just like, uh, I would say more so the vast depths of the ocean is is one of the things it's like oh we don't really know too much about and mm-hmm. then on top of that just like the earth like from the surface to the earth's core there could be so many things so many i mean you got so many movies that explore it right you got journey to the center of the earth you've yep. got uh what was it called core where core. the, where the yeah. planet's core stopped rotating stopped and they had rotating. to go nuke it <laughs> and they had to go, yeah, they had to set off a bunch of uh, seismic nukes in in uh, different orders in order to get the core to start rotating again. That movie I, is awesome. I always watch that every once in a while. It's so good. It's just, it's such a fascinating concept to kind of consider different visions of what are below us, right? These movies explore, just like I was saying, uh, dinosaurs and other creatures being down there or just e- enormous, I'm talking enormous caverns filled with you know, Geodes car-sized and... diamonds and yeah. whatnot. So there's like it's a, there's a number of things that could be there, and it's yeah. like very fascinating to see like what theories people have um, to see. Uh, obviously, science dunk on it in various ways, and and but like to learn how and why. Absolutely. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into what hollow earth theory is. I mean, again, I feel like a lot of people might know of it generally, but I want to dive into kind of its origin, uh, its prominence in science, and then go into the really, really interesting stories. But before I get too deep into this, I know a lot of task force members like to look at these theories and these mysteries themselves. Uh, Oddly enough, I want to throw in a a word of caution on this particular topic, because there are some problematic ideologies out there that use hollow earth theory to substantiate substantiate themselves. There are some uh, racist and anti-Semitic ideologies out there Wait, that what? use hollow earth. I had no idea. That but use I wanna... hollow earth. Oh yeah. We're not going to dive into those ones, no, of course. We shouldn't, they, but they that just sounds like out the there, dumbest so thing in the world. <laughs> what? Very strange. Yeah. Oh my God. People so just be mindful. Any... You know, people are problematic sometimes, but that blows my mind. Uh, yeah. Uh, but let's talk about hollow earth theory. It proposes that the Earth is entirely hollow and contains a substantial amount of interior space. The theory most notably suggested was uh, from English astronomer, geophysicist, mathematician, meteorologist, and physicist, this guy's got a colorful resume, Edmund Haley in the late 17th century. So Haley claimed that the planet is a series of spherical shells spinning in different directions around a central core. So he's not saying that it's like a pokeball where you just have an open <laughs> interior. He's saying it's like a, a bunch of concentric spheres. Right. Now, the, what I want to ask is, mm-hmm. are there people that have, that have like, I don't know, um, I guess I would say uh, stories uh, like they they have do they are there people out there that have hollow earth stories in what way in the in the way of like oh i experienced hollow earth or my grandfather experienced hollow earth oh yeah i mean there's okay what? so <laughs> there are a few that we're going to discuss today some of the Got more it. popular ones um there is a small story about a man in washington that I'll I'll dive into that one as well. But God, this is fascinating. <laughs> it's so fascinating. That's why I'm excited to be covering this one. But the concept 
of a subterranean land in some form, whether it's hollow earth or what have you. I mean, it's very common. You ask if there's stories, I mean, it's pervasive in Celtic lore, Native American culture, Hindu mythology and folklore, and many other ancient legends in general across the world have stories about what might lie beneath our feet. The subterranean land idea also has a lot of religious and cultural connections as well. So it stands to reason that there must be something Right, because a lot of these stories are stemming from this idea, and maybe it's just caves. We can, you know, we can That's get into true. That. It could just be some really deep caves. So, with regards to some of these beliefs, many of these beliefs and cultures look at the inside of the earth as a place for the afterlife. It's described in many different religions, like the Greek underworld. You have the Nordic Svartolfheimer. You have Christian hell. You have Jewish Sheol. So, there's a lot of afterlife connotations that people bring um, to this to the center of the earth. There's also the Tibetan Buddhist tradition that says that there is an ancient city located deep within the earth's core called Shambhala. And so not only is it for perhaps the afterlife, but now we open up the idea of an ancient civilization or at least an ancient city being located within the earth. I guess they could function theoretically right like if, if there's enough to sustain life then you can probably sustain like vegetation and maybe um i don't know cattle and all that kind of stuff right where would where would this life come from right like mo ultimately like on the outside of the earth it's all stemming from the sun sends its rays you know then you got vegetation turning that into energy and then you got animals eating that like what what is the source of energy inside the planet is it geothermal i mean that's what i would think right it, it, it's literally like you're starting to get your warmth and energy from the earth's core at that point but i obviously none of this is i don't believe hollow earth exists but <laughs> if i was if i was to try and make it like you know what i mean make yeah, it yeah. make sense that's kind of the route i'd start taking yeah i mean it's very interesting. I I want to be open-minded. It's just very difficult when you really start to dive into it. So if nothing else, it's a fascinating story. But mm -hmm. let's talk about U.S. Army Captain John Cleves Symes Jr., uh, not the senior. So 19th century is, is when John Cleves came forward, when John Cleves Symes came forward to suggest that the hollow earth theory does exist and that there are in fact holes at both ends of the planet, the North and South Poles, there are entrances in order to kind of access the interior. These theoretical holes have been referred to as Symes holes, and this was his major contribution to this theory. Symes himself believed that there were miles and miles beneath our feet, full of vegetation and fish, all for our taking. Of course, it was a very human centrist view of this whole thing yeah let's just go snatch everything up and mm -hmm. grab all the resources we can monetize it right and uh and i mean we also have authors such as raymond bernard who was a very big hollow earth proponent and academic he wrote a book called the hollow earth and this book actually emphasizes one of the most important parts of the theory is that the earth is a shell with walls now i don't know where he got these uh, dimensions but i think it's very interesting that he has them in general. 800 miles thick, and the polar region holes are 1,400 miles across. So these aren't small holes by any means. No, He's, they're large, but it's just interesting. Like, how do you have measurements? Yeah. He's saying that essentially, if you were to approach one of these holes, the way they kind of slope down and within, he almost describes that kind of experience. If you were to got, just walk up to the edge of the hole and then walk into it, you could. It would be like an ant uh, climbing around the precipice, the lip of a coffee mug. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where these holes size. supposedly slope in. They're not just a sheer cliff or anything. Interesting. So they just, so you could just walk right through? That's what Bernard is describing. Okay. Yeah. That a traveler could proceed over an edge of the hole and not be aware that they were actually entering the interior of the earth. He also explains that the holes have never been seen via air travel because while pilots believe that they are crossing the pole, what they're actually doing is following the hole's magnetic rim. So when one pilot says, I traverse directly over the poles, I would have seen some holes. He's like, no, you're following a compass and that compass 
is based on the magnetic effects of this rim, i.e. you're actually circumnavigating it while thinking you're going straight. Oh, interesting. They've really thought out like a bunch of different like reasons as to why this hasn't been found. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And I think that I don't know It it feels very flat earth theory. Yeah, it, 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 it just feels really disproved. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's disproved in many ways. It also just feels like it's reactive, you know, instead of like, right. Instead of like, hey, this is how it is. It's more just so, oh, you can't find it because of this. And oh, you're saying um, uh, you could just fly over it. Well, you can't because of that and this. And right. That. It's like, seems like they're just, it's like made up as it goes, kind of. Right, right. You have moving goalposts of evidence. So yeah. every time somebody disproves one step, you go, oh, but this is the answer to it. Yeah. Right. Like I said, this is definitely going to be something that can be scientifically at least quite vividly debunked in a lot of ways, but I I love the origin of some of these stories. I love the cultural and religious impacts to human history. I'm going to jump, I'm scrolling through my notes here. I'm going to jump straight to Mel's Hole. Uh, again, this episode is going to be a collection of stories that kind of surround this hollow earth theory because I just like to... Take, I don't know. I like to take a different perspective on reality sometimes because it's just so interesting. Oh, 100%. and Mel's hole is yeah, and Mel's hole is one of the stories that really drove me to want to discuss this topic. So, February twenty first, nineteen ninety seven, a Washington urban legend was brought to the world's attention. You might have heard of this one. I know it went kind of popular on the internet in recent years, but a man named Mel Waters called into the radio show that we've discussed before, Coast to Coast AM which often covered paranormal topics and things of that nature. He described, when he called in, he described a bottomless pit on his property in Ellensburg. I don't know how he stumbled across this pit, if it just showed up one day, but he decided, hey, this is a huge hole, let's see how deep it is. And he measured the depth by using a lot of spools of fishing line that he had. Each of these spools, yeah, each of these spools was 5,000 yards. Do you want to guess, just off the top of your head, how deep he measured this hole to be by this method. God, he probably used... Multiple 5,000 yard spools. I'll give you that as the clue. Like 10? I'm just trying to think of how many spools this person actually has. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe like 10 spools. So you're thinking 50,000 yards? Yeah. Let me actually, that that's a lot. Holy crap, hold on, 50,000 yards. <laughs> Why I'm would I convert to, to feet? Trying. I should convert to miles. Yeah, at that point. I'm, I'm just trying to think. 28 and a half miles. <laughs> I'm just trying to think, like, maybe this person found it and then just, like, how many spools would a person commit to? Less length right, and how right. many spools? And I was like, maybe 10 spools. Yeah, I mean... You're a little, you're a little off, but but your magnitude isn't that far off. He found <laughs> he found this hole to be eighty thousand feet deep. And Holy hell! Yeah, let me see, eighty thousand to miles. That's about fifteen miles, and for uh, the rest of the world, that is about twenty four and a quarter kilometers down. Not a not a shallow hole by any means. No, not at all. In fact, it was so deep, he came to the conclusion that this must actually be a bottomless hole. One little wrinkle that keeps coming to my mind every time I listen to this is that unless he had a weight on this thing, if he's lowering it down gently or I don't know, if once it's 80,000 feet away from you, you're going to have a hard time with something as light and flimsy as fishing line figuring out if you hit the bottom. Yeah, how would you even... I like the idea that maybe he found a hundred foot hole and he's just got a huge pile of fishing yeah. line at the bottom and he keeps Wait, lowering how, it. And he's like, huh, this must be bottomless. And it just keeps looping up at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how would you even track that? It's hard to say. I mean, I want to trust him, but we're also taking his word for it, you know? Oh, a thousand percent. And I'm not saying the technology isn't out there, but I'm just, what I'm trying to get at is that's not just something that someone has flying around right the technology to measure out like bottomless holes i i wonder i mean to do something like this is to actually measure a hole i feel like is he's done something similar to what would actually be done uh with high-tech equipment where you would drill down when you ran out of drill length you would pull back up disconnect attach a new attachment and then go down again and you would just kind of keep adding attachments as you drilled down 
Yes, um, and that's how you would measure it out, right? By so his method's not. For, I mean, I've heard this for like finding the bottom of a lake or whatever. But anyway, I mean, the, he's got a huge hole on his hands, and he thinks it's bottomless. And that felt substantiated because when he said he shouted into the hole, he wouldn't hear any sound come back. There was no echo coming back up to him, meaning that the sound was just swallowed into this infinite abyss. Mm. He then also said that his dogs and animals would refuse to go anywhere near it, almost like they sensed something was wrong with it. And Waters also claimed that he saw a black beam shoot up out of the hole. Oh my goodness. The right, story's once, getting once wilder. You, once you started mentioning the dogs, I was like, all right, here we go. Here's mm -hmm. where it gets wild. And boom, a black beam shooting out. <laughs> I, I just, I'm laughing about the next part because... Waters oh. has also said that he used this hole to get rid of waste. Very human. Yeah, I got a, I got a bottomless pit in my backyard. You want to dump some toxic waste back there? Jesus. So he's getting rid of waste and the remains of his cattle. He claimed that a neighbor actually discarded his deceased dog into the pit. And the next day, that very dog that had passed away returned to the land of the living. Oh, hell. Crawling up out of the hole. It's like a pet cemetery situation yeah. here. So immediately this becomes a, a paranormal, like supernatural hole. And I also like to think that in conjunction with the theory that there is an ancient civilization or a much more high tech advanced alien race that's living within our planet. This guy's just dumping corpses and, and crap right. down there. And, and they're just like in there. Comes, see if it comes back. <laughs> They, well, they're seeing if it comes back, but they're also like this this golden utopia within the earth, <laughs> and they're like, "Hey, some guys throwing crap yeah, out on us. What's imagine? going on?" All right, someone's using our like telescope to just throw trash down, and now right. we're getting corpses <laughs> of animals. Yeah, and you know what? This will freak them out. Resuscitate that puppy and send it back. Right. Or just like, well, I mean, we're not going to let this dog die. We have the technology or the mm -hmm. medicine. So it's back to life now. Goodbye. Go back up. Here's the thing, man. If if there is a civilization that is sufficiently advanced enough, their science will look like magic to us. And so uh, that's who's true. to say that's there true. isn't, you know, maybe this supports the idea that this is an alien civilization down there. A lot of people think that this is the origin of UFOs. And we'll we'll get into that. But wait, what? This yeah, is good. Well, All right. I thought we I thought we'd talk about dinosaurs. Um I'm, I'm <laughs> tr trust me, I, I'm not sad that we're not, or maybe we haven't gotten to it yet. I'm sure that's one of the things. But I, I just, all right, I, I didn't expect it to be this wild. This is pretty wild. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. It, it's this wild out here. Absolutely insane. So coming back to this hole, the location of what was now known as Mel's Hole is only known at this time by Waters himself and a few others that have claimed to have been there and seen it. Now, before Waters' radio appearance, there was actually another bottomless hole elsewhere known as the Devil's Hole. Now, this hole is in a remote area of... Death Valley National Park, and it's said to be nine feet wide with a 15 foot entrance of brick before the rest becomes earthen, right? Just earthen walls. Mm -hmm. This is another very, very deep hole that some think is bottomless, but again, was also used for dumping waste. Um, <laughs> go figure, humans just trying to find Jesus. holes to shove their crap into. Um, but many believe that these are actually the same hole. Either way, Waters later claimed that after the story went viral, you know, on the radio and whatnot, that government officials and, as he says, men in black types bought the section of land that contained the hole, bought it off of him on the condition that he left the country immediately. The country! They're like, hey, we're going to buy that hole, but you have to leave the country. I would just say, okay, then I'm not selling it. Right. But I mean, maybe it was like it, imminent domain sort of what, stuff. What if it was an obscene amount of money? What's obscene? Uh, Walk me through this one. I got a hole I'm ready to sell you. I don't... Uh, you got a hole. We're going to mm -hmm. throw hey, five oh, hey, million. What's up, Mr. Government? I've got a hole that I can throw so much crap into. Why would I ever want to get rid of it? Yeah, we're going to need you off that property, and we're going to offer you $5 million. Ooh, $5 million. That sounds pretty hefty, pretty mm -hmm. nice. I could buy so many dumpsters with that. Mm, yes, you can. So for $5 million, give us your property. What's the catch? What's the no, catch? I'll just you, move next door and find another hole. You got you to gotta leave the country. 
Ooh. Got any holes out there? <laughs> no, maybe. Maybe we could set you up with the smaller hole. <laughs> <laughs> Just like trading <laughs> holes out here. Okay, well, it, a lot of people looked at this hole and considered it to be the entrance to the hollow earth. Some actually believed that with everything that Mel was saying, that Mel's hole could be a portal to another dimension or that of a UFO landing site. Either way, Mel Waters may not even exist because, and this is where it gets very hairy and you can start to put on your tinfoil hat and say, did the government get involved? There are no records of a person by the name Mel Waters in Kittitas County where the town of Ellensburg Washington is located. So the question here is, was this hole there? Did it get bought by the men in black or some sort of government agency? And did they cover it up by getting this guy out of the country and scrubbing his identity from the records? Oh, damn. Because no one can find this this hole to this day. Oh, see, now it's just like... Did that ever really happen? Or, I mean, because there's definitely cover-ups. There's, mm-hmm. it's, there's 1,000% there's cover-ups. But the fact is, like, is everything a cover-up? No. And I'll just, I'll never know. Dang. I just want to see this hole. I want to I skip a rock into it or something. I just want to know if the hole's real or not. I don't, you know, hollow earth or not. I just want to know if it's real. Yeah. So that's the story of Mel's hole and the the connection to the hollow earth. But you keep talking about dinosaurs, so I want to jump into the next kind of chapter, which is that of underground life. The the stories of it, the idea that the hollow earth harbors some sort of life. Hell yeah. They tend to go hand in hand. If you're a hollow earth theorist, you tend to have a strong belief that the inner world or inner worlds are home to something alive, plants or otherwise. Now, the different ideas of what life might exist range from things like life very similar to ours. There are also theories that purport that there are UFOs and flying saucers that actually originate from within the planet, come to the outer sphere where we are, observe human behavior, maybe perhaps tamper with our futures, preventing violence like nuclear war, etc., etc. But there are also other theories that there are groups of strange individuals that are actually quite dissimilar from us. And some of these stories stem from Mexican legends that claim that there are groups of people within the planet coming from a place called Way Down Deeps. That's how they refer to it. And with regards to how these people live within the planet, as we kind of talked about at the top, uh, you know, our our energy derives from the sun, long story short. Well, Ed- Edmund Haley's hypothesis of the hollow earth alludes to the theory of a small sun hanging in the very center of our hollow earth in a hollow space. And that's what creates the lush and livable environment on the flip side of the earth's surface. Small sun? Like that's a small sun hanging. It, like the suns eventually just die. <laughs> Well, they expand. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, they don't they like expand, die, they can become a dwarf or a black hole, etc. Mm hmm. Or just explode. Yeah, that's just dangerous. <laughs> Seems very dangerous. I also don't know how that would happen, but. Although small, doesn't it have a massive gravitational pull? I mean, if it was in the exact middle, it would be evenly spread, right? I guess, yeah. No, see, here's the thing the Earth, as it spins, it's wider at the equator due to that spinning. So technically, if you're on the very top of the planet versus on the equator, you would have a different distance to the center of the planet, i.e. you would have a different weight. Weird. Anyway, so this the vision of a sun being in the very center of the planet was derived from a handful of actually famous mathematicians and scientists such as Leonard Euler in the 18th century, as well as Sir John Leslie in the 19th century. However, as you can imagine, many of these accreditations seem to be a bit hazy. It's hard to prove that um, that these are substantiated, um, you know, hypotheses. Yeah, it'd just be hard to prove any of this, period. And, and the thing it doesn't help, too, is that a lot of this, like, a lot of the theories are also, like, mixed or engulfed in something outlandish. <laughs> Like the mm-hmm. sun in the middle of the earth. Also, like, I think it's quite interesting to think that UFOs came from the center of the earth, right? It could be like, I guess like it would be an advanced civilization that is nesting towards the earth's core and is far more advanced and is using uh, 
advanced technology like UFOs to come out of these holes, float mm-hmm. around and, and do things. It makes me think of like Atlantis. The story yeah. of Atlantis where the city yeah. sunk and then they were just wiped. Well, what if they managed to, or always were, within the planet and they developed separately and they developed these high-tech, you know, whatever. A lot of a lot of people think that the UFOs stem from hollow Earth because there have been so many stories of people seeing UFOs coming up out of the ocean or coming back from, you know, the airspace, coming back into the ocean, almost as if there are certain spots within lakes and other bodies of water that they come in and out of. I did not know that. Yeah. That's it's, crazy. That's, yeah, it's uh, it's partly why I wanted to do this episode is because there's so many just little loose ends like that. The more we discuss mysteries at large, the more I start to see these little trends that all kind of fit within a topic. And so that's why I wanted to just kind of talk about some of them. But there, there's even like fighter pilots that have declassified videos where they are tracking a like a little spherical object or some sort of pill shaped object you know Mm -hmm. um and you see them go what looks like below the waves or disappear and then come back up out of the waves i don't know i don't know maybe maybe there is something to that or maybe there's just something we don't fully understand yet but it's it's just weird to track objects that seem to be going fast that come in and out of the water um if they're not like a dolphin (laughs) that just breaches water like crazy i just i just never thought of it I don't know. I just never thought about it in that way, right? That it would... I always thought it'd float up and away as opposed to mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. floating into the water ocean. Here's the thing. If you had to choose which was more likely, Atlantis or Hollow Earth? Oh my gosh. And they couldn't be together, huh? No. You had to choose one or the other to be I real. I would say the idea of Atlantis got so exaggerated, right? Like we all yeah. believe that it's like this hyper advanced thing that they're like flying around and teleporting and stuff. I think if you just like take it back to basics, that it was just a utopia for its time. And then nature took its course and it got, you know, swept out to sea or what Mm -hmm. have you. I think that's way more believable than the bending of physics to make the earth hollow. Or, (gasps) or hollow core isn't as like flashy as you think it is. Maybe it's just something that's dug way deep right and then people are just nesting in it nesting yeah you talking about just like cave dwellers yeah i mean maybe they just like built some like super deep bunker and they just live down there Ooh. and they just outsource their products from the surface etc but like that's that's quote hollow earth it's just some civilization that like dug real deep and decided to live down down under I mean, we are going to talk about like the Paris catacombs and the European tunnels. There are a lot of different, if not ancient, uh, pathways under under the surface, very, very deep, that feel like what you're saying, right? Oh, okay. This could be the more realistic. So, okay, so this, I don't want to jump topics just yet, but like those Paris catacombs, right, the, the European tunnels could be what made ancient peoples believe that the earth was hollow, that these were pathways to what would have to open up further, right? They almost feel mm-hmm. so deliberate that they would have to be. And so maybe that's what happened was there is uh, that truth is somewhere in between, that the earth isn't necessarily hollow, but it is hollow in the sense of these tunnels existing and there being these large voids that, like you're saying, maybe people or otherwise life found themselves living in. That's entirely yeah. possible. Yep. That's what I'm seeing. Yeah. Yeah. But before we get into that, let's talk about the very fantastic idea, the the various interpretations of what life might be within our planet. I want to kind of close the chapter on the more um, sensational and fantastic visions of what the hollow earth might be before we dive into those more real uh, plays. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So coming back to Symes, he himself, the person who thought about the 1400 mile wide holes at the poles. So he himself was like, listen, I think the earth inside is also inhabitable. If we could find it, we would find ourselves like stocked with vegetables, stocked with animals, maybe even other humans or human type uh, species that we would be able to communicate with. The most commonly believed idea of who or what inhabits the hollow earth is that of a lush tropical paradise. I mean, we've seen it in the films, right? You're talking about dinosaurs. Oh, yeah. You got the remake with the rock, mm-hmm. you got those giant mosquitoes. 
but yeah, I mean, that's what a lot of people envision to be within the planet. Uh, and, and then within that tropical paradise, there is some form of ancient uh, yet advanced race of humans or aliens or giants. Because yep. a lot of people think, and then this is, again, diving back into the world of cryptids, a lot of people believe that this internal world, whatever we want to call it, is the origin of a lot of cryptids or the origin of giants, if not all cryptids. Maybe or, this is just what it is. Uh, or King Kong. Kong. King Kong. Yeah, yeah. We got the kaiju. They, yeah, they explored Hollow Earth in that movie. Which was, I did not expect that. I forgot. That was a Godzilla, was it? Godzilla versus, <laughs> versus King Kong? Kong, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there's a whole temple down there mm -hmm. where the many Kongs run wild, or used to. Um, used to, mm, R.I.P. Well, hello again, Task Force. You know what it is. It's the time where I get to sit down with my phone in front of me and then talk to you directly about some fantastic things we've got going on. For example, store.roosterteeth.com has all of our good offerings. If you wanted to support us with our pride merch or the upcoming plushie of baby hands, you know, we got all sorts of stuff over there. And to reiterate, proceeds from the pride merch will also go to benefit out youth. I encourage you to check them out. They're a very fantastic organization, and I'm happy that we're supporting them with our merch. But as always, we really appreciate all the free support that you can offer as well by sharing this podcast with a friend or even doing a review. Five-star reviews mean a whole lot in an algorithmically driven world. It helps us find new audiences and stay afloat with our current ones. It's weird. It's a weird world where you subscribe to something and it doesn't come across your plate unless you, uh, unless you seek it out. So help us uh, fight the algorithm. The, oh, big algorithms out there trying to get us. Anyway, uh, thank you all so much for your support. And I want to talk about some fantastic sponsors that we have today. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by BetterHelp. Life can be overwhelming, and many people are burned out without even knowing it. Symptoms can include lack of motivation, feeling helpless or trapped, detachment, fatigue, and more. We associate burnout with work, but that's not always the only cause. Any of our roles in life can lead us to burnout, and BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to prioritize yourself. Talking with someone can help you figure out what's going on in your life, what's causing your stress, perhaps. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. I have that very same uh, turn off the camera, I'm shy kind of situation going on myself, so I really appreciate that part of their service. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Task Force, if you're interested, you can get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash redweb. That's B E T. T E R H E L P dot com slash red web. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by Raycon. Lately, I've been listening to a lot of Kendrick Lamar. I'm trying to get ready for his newest album dropping here in, looking at my watch for the date. I think it's about two weeks, just shy of two weeks as of recording this thing, just to date myself here. But it's been great. Uh, one reason that it's been great is because I get to use my Raycon wireless earbuds wherever I do it. Usually I'm on my walks or riding a bike and they're nice and snug and they stay in there. They also have very flashy colors and some less flashy colors if you want to accessorize with these earbuds to fit your everyday look. Raycon's everyday earbuds look, feel, and sound better than ever with optimized gel tips for the perfect in-ear fit. These earbuds are so comfortable. I use the big ones because I got those big honking ears. I like to listen. You know what I mean? So I put on the big gel tips. They don't fall out. They don't go tumbling when I'm running down the street. It's, it's pretty nice. Raycons offer three sound profiles to match what you're listening to. Plus, they have noise isolation and awareness mode, which is fantastic. So you can choose to be immersed in the sound if you want, but you can also hear your surroundings when you need to if you're in an airplane or someone's pestering you at the uh, the local barista place uh, <laughs> and you, you want to talk to them. Uh, but it's no wonder Raycon's everyday earbuds have over 49,000 five-star reviews. Check out Raycon's wireless earbuds. My guess is that you're going to want to leave them a five-star review as well. Go to buyraycon.com slash redweb to get yourself 15% off your Raycon order. Once again, that's buyraycon.com slash redweb to score 15% off buyraycon.com slash red web. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by Upstart. Saying goodbye to high interest credit card debt is one of the first steps towards financial independence. But the interest month after month can feel like you're on a never ending hamster wheel, and that's where Upstart comes in. Upstart powered personal loans can help you pay down high interest debt all online with simple and easy to understand payment terms. 
Upstart has helped over 1.8 million customers on their path to financial freedom. Whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses, Upstart can help you get one fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. Don't wait and check your rate today at upstart.com slash redweb. Again, that's upstart.com slash redweb to check your rate today. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you, and loan amounts will be determined based on a few factors such as credit, income, and other information that you're going to provide during your loan application process. Go to upstart.com slash redweb to get started, and remember, do your due diligence. Finances are a very important part of your life, and so I want to make sure that you do your research. And with that said, let's get right back into the mystery. But yeah, like that, what was interesting to me about that was like, it wasn't that the earth was this very thin shell of a planet with this huge hollow earth. It was a super, super long, tiny tunnel that made its way to this tiny little pocket on the middle of the earth. It just felt like a big old cave. So... Now that we've talked about that broadly, uh, I want to kind of help substantiate some of the opinions out there about there being an ancient yet advanced civilization down there. Um, Rodney Clough, who is a Hollow Earth believer, wrote about a population in his book called World Top Secret, Our Earth is Hollow. So he says that the inhabitants are believed to be descendants of the ancient races such as the Lemurians, or the Lost Ten Tribes of Israel, that they were guided there through the North Polar openings by God himself, and that the population is generally described as peace-loving and extremely advanced with flying saucer-type technology. They have perfect health and they can live for hundreds of years, and that is why they, that we see flying saucers sometimes, and that these uh, people are keeping watch over us as human beings and trying to make sure that we don't annihilate ourselves. Right, um, because they also live on the planet as well. Right, uh, and, and I'm sure that there's some sort of environmental balance between the outer and inner worlds. Um, but a more strange theory about who, hollow, who inhabits the hollow earth is that it's actually us, you and me, uh, just regular people. Um, so it, it is also kind of like the movie Us, is that oh. was it was it that one where you have like the tethered you have the like yeah, clone yeah, yeah. version of you yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so this one is where it starts to get much more fantastic but natural healer and cult leader Cyrus Teed formed an idea about cellular cosmology where the entire universe actually exists all within a shell and according to Teed's idea we are actually living on the inside of the hollow earth and when we look up at the universe where it's actually an illusion created by a strange solar mechanism. So what he's saying is oh. there isn't a tethered version of us, but instead we are currently right now in the hollow earth. And when we look up at the stars, we are essentially looking up at an illusion. Um, oh, so uh, theoretically, if you were to take a spaceship and just keep going, 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 eventually you'd hit like the surface of the earth. Oh my God, I guess so. Right? Um, like, also, yeah. I, like, I like the fact that all this is coming from uh, you said a cult leader. It's a cult leader. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's not let's right. not shy let's, away from it. it he is uh, in fact I a cult leader. Whole, this whole check is like no, no, no. Leader. Yeah. Um, also, in, if it helps, uh, this cult was disbanded after Teed's death in 1908. So if that gives you a time frame as well mm. as to uh, you know, because then we started exploring 60 years after this, we started exploring space, and then you start to poke holes in the idea that well, we kind of kept going up and we landed on something. So now what? Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, this this theory gained a lot of traction. He developed himself a small cult around it called the uh, Koreshian Unity after he, re he renamed himself Koresh, uh, and that's okay. how it got the name of this cult. But, but yeah, now that was one of the more fantastic visions of what lies within our planet. Now, as a good segue to the more realistic ideas, I want to talk about the underground city of Derinkuyu, which is actually in Turkey, and it was where an underground civilization was living. And uh, and so this is kind of a natural segue to the tunnels and to the catacombs and everything, because this was an actual place that existed. And it went, it had like 11 different levels uh, within this kind of underground city. And it reached up to 280 feet below the surface. So it's not super deep, right? but, but it does really start to give you the idea that maybe there's something here and maybe that some of these stories are just extra versions of of what was actually going on see that's what i'm saying what if it's just a somewhat deep civilization right that gut check man so 
this was one of the largest, if not the largest, excavated underground cities in Turkey. It was large enough to have sheltered as many as 20,000 people, uh, enough room for wine and oil presses, stables, cellars, storage rooms, refectories, and chapels. So they got a whole thing going on down here. And this city was formed during the Byzantine Empire when it was primarily used for protection during various wars going on. And, And throughout the ages, it seemed to be used by various groups and religions Uh, and religious peoples as a place for protection. Um, But yeah, I mean, it was, it was opened up in the late sixties for visitors to come check it out. And uh, many tunnels were discovered and rediscovered after this, this area was kind of excavated. So, I mean, this is very natural, like I said, segue into the idea of the European tunnels, because you're right. I mean, maybe people were just finding deep places to live and much like modern man wants to build upwards now why wouldn't we you know in the past consider digging downwards it was an easy way to increase your population density if you had like a town center without needing to build vertically because it wasn't until recent centuries that we could have stable structures that went quite tall except for i i suppose pyramids which are uh oh yeah but even then like there's (laughs) mystery surrounding pyramids and oh yeah itself yeah so i don't know it's a it's it's interesting I, but that's that's where I settle. Like if, if there was Hollow Earth, it, it's just it's that, but just that it'll fantasize, elaborated on. Mm-hmm. Have you heard before we get to them? Have you heard about the European tunnels? No. In Europe, there's a massive network of underground tunnels known as the Erdstahl tunnels. The term Erdstahl actually it comes from Germany, and it loosely translates to earth stable or mining tunnel, which are two completely different translations. But there you have it. Uh, A major misconception about these tunnels is the idea that they connect all together, that they are one unified network that stretch from Turkey all the way as far as Scotland. But in looking through the research and in exploring these over the many centuries, they don't seem to actually connect. However, these tunnels are found across Europe. So you have isolated tunnels in Germany, Austria, France, Ireland, Scotland, Um, There's no proof that these tunnels actually reach to Turkey, but of course, as we just discussed, there are underground cities, or at least the one in Turkey. I guess, like, what would be the pros to being in an underground city? I think if you wanted to have a lot of people within a certain footprint, right? Mm. Much like if, uh, you know... Japan is a good example of like how tight their cities are and how vertical they they kind of focus because they're on an island and they can only expand out so far and so their True. cities end up building vertically and so if for any, any reason you are constrained uh, geopolitically or what have you uh, you might be inclined to dig downwards because maybe that's the more cost effective way to increase your population density um, yeah that makes a ton of sense But yeah, I mean, like, it does seem to be an inordinate amount of effort to do. So you would almost have to find a natural structure and then live within that. Or, you know, you have something like Mesa Verde where they have cliff faces that they then kind of carved into in order Mm. to make shelter that way. Yeah, you're right. It's just like not enough real estate. Yeah, pretty much. So now these tunnels, unlike... A major city or unlike mel's hole that we talked about being huge these tunnels in reality are only three to five feet tall sometimes like two feet wide so they're very cramped and they can be of varying lengths but they tend to be something like 50 meters long give or take oh this doesn't seem large at all doesn't seem very large no no now we're Um, talking tiny holes we got tiny holes um but they're big enough for people to pass through, and, th- and that's just about it. Some of these tunnel systems feature loops at the ends or nooks for larger areas. So, like, essentially, if you get down to the end of one of these small uh, pathways, there might be an open area for seating, storage, or rooms. The larger areas at the end of these tunnels are known as, and forgive me, Germans, Schlusskammer, uh, or the final chamber, as it is translated to. So the tunnels themselves, as I described, are quite small. Some of the tunnel systems feature uh, various less small uh, areas, right? There's nooks and larger areas. Some of these tunnels mm-hmm. lead to what look like rooms that have seating, the possibility of storage, etc. cetera. Um, a lot of people have tried to figure out how old these tunnels are, but there's so little archeological available evidence 
and uh, and it makes determining the age of these tunnels very very difficult, which thereby makes the purpose of these tunnels very difficult to determine. Um, there are coal markings within these tunnels. There are stones and ceramics found within these tunnels. And all of this gives an origin ranging from the year 950 all the way up to the 12th century. So there's quite a wide area where yeah, these tunnels of, could have started. Of time. And it's just like, it's very interesting that there's just like no way for, I guess, geologists to really like pinpoint mm -hmm. the time of the tunnels. Usually it's just like, okay, we'll see how this is. This is aged through this way, and this this mineral is decayed through that way. And yeah, but I guess there's just no way to do it. It just feels weird because I I'm confused on if these are natural formations because they look many of them look like natural formations, but then a lot of people are talking about them as if they were created. And I wonder yeah. if there isn't some sort of in between because you know there are these slip passages. That's what they call them, where one tunnel connects through a very narrow opening to another tunnel. And these slip passages, maybe those were man-made, whereas the rest of these tunnels were natural. But either way, the major theory behind these tunnels is that they were either used for protection or transportation. And again, these tunnels were small enough, just big enough for an individual to pass through. And so it doesn't seem like it's the most efficient mode of, or method of transportation. But again, who knows, maybe these were also just storage units, uh, places that you could put things away um you could observe certain religious ceremonies in these kind of more these u-turny areas right where the tunnels opened up into kind of little rooms it's really hard to say yeah maybe it was just used to transport like i don't know materials and goods and stuff like that because they're 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 fairly tiny still mm-hmm so we've talked about how the tunnels are very small let's talk about the origin of these tunnels because I tend to think like they, they look like natural formations, but a lot of people believe that they were created. Uh, but there's a huge swath of time in which these tunnels could have been founded. In fact, there's very, very little, surprisingly, archaeological evidence behind these tunnels that make placing an origin on when these tunnels came into being very, very difficult. People have observed coal, they've seen stones and ceramics found in these tunnels, and that kind of suggests that the origin of these tunnels is somewhere between the year 950 all the way over to the 12th century. And then you have German archaeologist Dr. Heinrich Kusch, who states in his book that there are tunnels under hundreds of Neolithic settlements all over the continent, and he himself has, through his research, come to the conclusion that these tunnels were created 5,000 years ago but initially he thought they were developed around 12,000 years ago. So here we have just a wide swath of, of origin stories for these tunnels. But either way, the, the s most experts tend to agree that regardless of their origin, when that was, that the purpose behind these tunnels was simply protection from predators or otherwise storage of things, or some even believe that there were these were ways to travel safely from one area to another during times of war or violence or when the weather above the ground was violent. Either way, they wouldn't be very efficient modes of transportation because they are as small as a, an, a person. But either way, one interesting fact before we move on to the Paris catacombs is that mm -hmm. Cush himself in his, in his book notes that the chapels, remember there are some rooms that these tunnels lead to. Some of them are are purported to be chapels and the reason why they exist at the entrances is because a, a lot of people were worried about the evil energy that would emanate from entering what they thought was the underworld that this area would be unholy and so that by that by entering via a chapel and also leaving that one would be cleansed of having gone into and used these tunnels so it's all very interesting but also equally frustrating in that it's difficult to pin down why they came into being how much of them were man-made versus natural, and were they used for anything other than potential transportation or storage? I like to think it's either storage or just like an easy getaway, an yeah. escape to shelter. But yeah, I, mean, I guess, like, you know, especially being attached to Neolithic settlements, that that right. seems to make sense. And, and I think there's like, there's just really no way of pinpointing it down, especially when you have experts saying 12,000 years and then all of a sudden it's like 5,000. It's like, well, that's more than half. You're cutting like the oh, time yeah. down. And oh, so yeah. So it's like, I, I mean, who's to say that it's not going to go back up or go down? And I don't know. Yeah, there's no way of pinpointing it, I guess. I mean, we're, we're talking about 950 to the 12th century. So we're talking about 
you know, the year 1000 to the year 11,000 or 1100 rather. Uh, 5,000 years ago is 3000 BC. 12,000 years ago is before the pyramids. So this is such a huge amount of time. <laughs> Massive gap. But suffice to say, long story short, these tunnels exist. They're very interesting. And I do think that uh, an ancient peoples might have found these and it might have just opened their ideas up to the idea of there being a hollow earth or there being civilizations within it. Um, but let's talk about the Paris catacombs because these things are the origin story for so many different horror films out there. I don't oh, know yeah. if you've seen As Above, So Below. Oh, yes, I have. Whew. Very good stuff. That movie touches on the very real fact that these catacombs are a maze. They seem to go on forever. And there are whole sections that are permanently blocked off because people have gone down them and just disappeared. People don't know where they went, why they went, how they what? went. They just know that they got lost and were never found again. And so they are just blocked off areas. Oh, that's terrifying. Mm-hmm. How do we not know? So I don't know. I just like what I want so badly is for that uh, spelunking device that they used in Promethean or Prometheus, mm -hmm. where they like send the drone into this yep. kind of cavernous system. Yeah, and it maps it out. And he goes <laughs> and just scans it. I'm like, I want that so bad for the Paris catacombs. It'd be so sad. So wait, like, okay, when they're like exploring this area and it's like, oh, this person went missing, they go down mm -hmm. there. Is it just like endless? Is that why they can't find bodies? Or it's just like a, it lead, eventually it leads to a handful of dead ends and they just go, there's nothing here. So I think there's a bunch of dead ends, but I also think that a lot of people think that they just keep extending and extending, that they, that they haven't been fully explored. And there could even be pitfalls and pit traps and backward loops that, you know, one might just get lost in and never yeah. get discovered. Um, I don't know. It's it's also hard to, to kind of delineate between fact and fiction because something as dark and sinister in nature as the Paris catacombs, I mean, filled to the brim with human remains, right? It's also very touristy. And so oh, a lot yeah. of stories get sensationalized. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to know. But, but realistically, though, there are definitely dangers to going into the Paris catacombs. Uh, you want to take a guided tour if you're going to do it. And if you see a spot that's blocked off, you should probably heed that because <laughs> you could get easily disappeared in there. Wait, can you go and not have guided tours? Let me actually, let me see. Because I, I feel like there are ways into them because they're just right. essentially under the city of Paris. And if there are people that explore cities by like getting on, it's definitely illegal, but you can definitely do it. Oh my gosh. It, it's like those folks that get onto the top of skyscrapers and dangle mm. off the edge or or people that visit abandoned cities. It's, it's totally possible. There are waterlogged areas of the catacombs. There are spots where you literally have to lay down and your chest and back are touching the floor and ceiling at the same time. So you got to like really spelunk your way through there. Um, Holy hell. Yeah, it's, it's possible, just highly illegal. Oh, I bet. So the Paris catacombs on April 7th of 1786, uh, the site was declared as a sacred Paris municipal ossuary. Then it took on the mythical name of the catacombs, uh, which was a reference to the Roman catacombs. In the late 18th century, major public health problems linked to the Paris cemeteries led a decision to transfer the human bones and the remains to an underground site. Now, there could be a relation between the Paris catacombs and the European tunnels. In fact, they could be one and the same in, in their origin. But it's, it's because of this public health risk over in the 18th century that made people believe, okay, well, we might be catching illnesses from the dead. Let's just move all of the remains of individuals down to an underground site, down into these tunnels. Tombs and graves were then emptied of their bones, which were then transported to the underground areas at night so as to avoid the obvious spectacle and you, public yeah. disturbance. <laughs> Just um, like carrying these bodies in the street. Wait a minute. That's my paw. You know, like oh, God. just tumbling bones around it. But I mean, that's that's why when you look at the catacombs, it's just a collection of bones. Yeah. Sometimes you see the really dramatic photo of just like a wall of skulls. Um, yeah, and that's the why like they're it just, is. They're just like, all right, get them in there and let's mm -hmm. get out. Let's leave. Man, very morbid. I would, uh, 
hate to see the more, uh, let's just say, juicy bodies that were moved into these catacombs. Oh, right, because they're not all just going to be bones. Some might still have flesh on them and decaying at different rates. And, uh, mm-hmm. God. So the reason why they picked the catacombs, or at least what became of the catacombs, was because the the site's entrance was easily accessible, and it was right outside the capital, the Tombe Isoir quarries that were under the plain of Montrouge. So these quarries that were nearby just made a very, very convenient place to move these bodies. And this quarry was so big, such a labyrinthian spot that extended under the city, 800 hectares, or about 2,000 acres. That's about 3.125 square miles. So pretty big for a uh, for a labyrinthian quarry that then became a catacomb. Yeah, it's massive. I can see why they want to throw bodies in there. And then beginning in 1809, people were then able to visit the catacombs by appointment. So initially in the late 1700s, they're like, we got to get these bodies out of here due to health concerns and all of that. And then within the next couple decades, they're like, all right, you can go visit it now. And, uh, you know, people could come in. There was like a, a register where you could leave your impressions at the end of the circuit where the tour was. These visits then became very, very successful for both the French and foreign visitors alike. And during the 19th century, it kind of just expanded into more of a thing. Um, Sometimes they would be closed for months or quarters on end, and then sometimes they'd be just open. But either way, you can still visit the Paris catacombs to this day, where the remains of six million people remain. Yeah, six million people were moved down there. What a project. That's a huge job. That's Mm -hmm. That's massive. But either way, the reason why both the European tunnels and the Paris catacombs are part of this episode is not only does it ground hollow earth in a little bit more of reality, it also offers for the more um, hollow earth centric believers, there are theories that these slip tunnels that combine these labyrinthian tunnel networks, they're believed that there are some hidden ones that once found would take you yet deeper into the earth. And we've only just scratched the surface of these tunnels. And these are subsequently a, a almost like a backdoor entrance into the hollow earth, you know, because we have the holes at the poles and then we have these, these tunnel systems across the planet. But that leads us to the end of this discussion where I kind of want to close the chapter by not like dunking on hollow earth. I want to at least talk about some of the scientific theories and experiments that then disprove some of hollow earth's key principles. Mm-hmm. That's, I'm sure there's a ton of science that really disproves mm-hmm. it and breaks it down. And yeah. So let's start with, uh, Charles Hutton and his Shehalian experiment back in 1774. So the Shehalian experiment was an 18th century experiment designed to test the mean density or the average density of the earth. Essentially what they would do is hang a pendulum down on a long string and you could then assess the vertical hang of this pendulum. Essentially what they would do is try to prove that mountains had their own amount of gravitational pull. Uh, and, and to try to prove that the Earth was hollow, they would be nearby a large, isolated, rocky formation such as a mountain. And if they hung this pendulum down to the Earth, if the Earth was solid, it would have so much more mass than that mountain that there would be no wavering in that pendulum. It would be dead right. center and be, be pointing just, straight down. It would be pulled. Yeah, but you're right. If the Earth was hollow, then there's less mass within the Earth, meaning that that mountain nearby might actually have a measurable impact on that pendulum, and it would pull it just a little bit off center. So suddenly you would see a the vertical hang would be off center just a little bit. And from that, you could prove that either, yes, the Earth was hollow, or you could at least try to gather the average density of the planet. That sounds so, like simple it sounds very <laughs> simple it's it just like but there's so much to it and it's just yeah. something i never would have thought of mm-hmm. i mean a lot of people have kind of poked holes in this experiment uh but on the whole in principle it does make sense um but this experiment was never used to prove 
uh, Hollow Earth because the fact that it it didn't it it points straight down because again the the density of the Earth so greatly exceeds that of its surface yeah. rocks that there's you know it it proves that there must be something denser below us than than that of just open air. You also have seismic waves, which help disprove this theory because when earthquake happens somewhere on the earth or some sort of dramatic seismic event, uh, these seismic waves are created. These are waves of energy that travel through the earth's layers and are the results of, like I said, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, other natural disasters, etc., that kind of ring the earth's bell, as it were. You can, by way of various, very sensitive global measurement systems, you can track those waves as they kind of ripple around the inside of our planet. And from analyzing the speed of those waves, how long they take to travel from one side of the earth to the other and how they dissipate, evidence from that seems to indicate that the earth is most likely filled with solid rock, liquid nickel iron alloy, as well as solid nickel iron. That's figured out by the way of um, just how quickly this energy transfers through a medium you can kind of backwards out figure out the density and then from that you can like look at how people analyzed rock and soil samples and then go okay well nickel iron makes a lot of sense it's the most abundant and also mm -hmm. it holds that density but then it's not it's whew. I did mean, that, it's it. No, it all too hard. No, it all makes sense. It's just way smarter <laughs> people figuring stuff out. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, such a uh, such a good reason for the world to be global, right? Because you mm -hmm. have just people everywhere with these with this equipment, and you imagine like ancient civilizations. You know, if they were in isolation, maybe that's why they all developed the same thing around the same time, because whatever. But now that we can like speak to one another at the speed of light and we can compare measurements and share notes, you you, you can figure this kind of stuff out like so much more easily. But then uh, the, the last kind of wrinkle in the idea of hollow earth is, is, is gravity. Obviously we weren't there to watch the planet be born, but massive objects in general tend to clump together gravitationally. And if you were to kind of extrapolate that out over billions of years, that's how you get planets and stars and uh, a lot of just yep. dust and atoms kind of collect. And uh, they are inclined to create a solid object. It would be very, very difficult to create something that is traditionally just hollow. Tunnels, passages, caves, those can all be formed later. Um, and they have, obviously, but I don't think that that's what we're referring to when we say traditionally hollow earth. Yeah, it would all the everything would pack together. It wouldn't mm -hmm. just be like, OK, we're just going to have a pocket here and a pocket there. Right. You know, you look at the the Godzilla versus Kong depiction of, of hollow earth. I think that makes more sense because of how thick the crust is. If you're going to, you know, kind of open mm -hmm. up the idea of hollow earth, but the traditional sense of hollow earth if there's multiple spheres within one another, or if it's like you can traverse through the Earth's crust as a human being and pop into the interior world, it would mean that the crust would be so thin, right? given the size of the planet, that the Earth would just kind of collapse. They wouldn't have enough structure uh, to hold itself up. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Because then everything, just the weight and the gravitational pull mm -hmm. would just start crumbling down on top of each other yeah but either way though i mean that that kind of like in my scientific scientifically inclined mind closes the book on hollow earth but man do i still love a good hollow earth story i i, I just like all the stories that come out about people saying like they saw these beams of light coming right. up from outside of the earth or aliens stemming from that there's so many like shorter shorter stories that apply to this that i just i just like it for our, at least an entertainment value yeah, um, oh, that's 1,000% why I wanted this episode, because yeah. I know there'd be really random stuff, and uh, obviously, you know, the catacombs being mm -hmm. one, and that just seems like a, a whole mystery in itself, and with the disappearances, and then also UFOs coming out of the... like. It, oh, wild. yeah. You know, <laughs> aliens are always behind it. They're it, always in there. I mean, but also a good point, you know, we could be the aliens. Oh, my God. I well, that, that is a whole theory, that... Uh, UFOs are just future humans traveling back yep. in time. What if we're just watching ourselves like a zoo? Yeah. Weird. Watching, studying, seeing what we can, where we went wrong. I mean, there's all kinds of like time travel, like oh. books and comics and movies. Let me, let me blow your mind before we end this one. Do you realize 
if time travel is ever to be realized or if it's possible in any, in any way that you would be able to, I'm going to hyper simplify this. You would be able to peer back through time through almost just a window. You would basically just be able to look back along the time stream and be able to see the past. Right now, you could be being watched by future Diaz's, right? Yeah. Your great, 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 great grandkids could be peering back on you right now. Mm-hmm. So literally, it makes me feel like nothing is secret. No, nothing at all. And then you have people that's like, oh, I want to be off the grid and hide all my information. Then there could be super advanced technology mm-hmm. that's more invasive than anything ever created. Oh, man, that kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies <laughs> thinking about it. But this has been the Hollow Earth uh, discussion. There are so many like smaller stories that I think we're going to cover on our TikTok platform because they're just like little like minute bite-sized anecdotes. But uh, I'm glad we did another like interesting episode where we took a, a subject that seems to be at the center of a lot of different, very interesting stories and, and then kind of combine them together. But with that said, Fredo, I'll see you right back here next Monday for another mystery. Later, Task Force.